Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm uh, Council President Lorena Gonzalez, and I'm pleased to be joined by two of my colleagues this morning, Council Member Herbold, Chair of the Public Safety and Human Services Committee, and also Council Member Tammy Morales, uh, who is the Chair of the Community Economic Development Committee and uh, represents District 2. Council Member Herbold represents District 1. We are here this morning to discuss the steps that the City Council is proposing to take to address the urgent need to demilitarize and defund the Seattle Police Department while reinvesting in black communities, indigenous communities, and other communities of color. Like many of you, I have watched with dismay as the SPD has failed to demonstrate restraint or exercise the de-escalation principles that should be the hallmark of a truly reformed law enforcement department. The culture change we are pushing for and have been pushing for since the, the uh, consent decree has failed to materialize. The city council has taken initial votes, initial votes yesterday to begin the process of transforming how the city of Seattle ensures community safety for everyone, but particularly for BIPOC communities. Meanwhile, it is unfortunate that we are faced with the reality that we have an executive who insists on sowing seeds of fear and misinformation, further dividing our community in a time of unprecedented crisis all the while calling for unity. Claims that acts of violence, particularly sexual violence and rape, claims that those things will go unanswered under the council's proposed plan are irresponsible. And if this were true, the accountability for that outcome would be squarely on the shoulders of the Seattle Police Department. I recently received a letter signed by over 600 advocates and survivors of sexual violence stating that they want investments for community-based healing and solutions like housing options and living wages. These are things that help domestic violence and sexual assault survivors heal and rebuild after their trauma. Furthermore, in this letter, they reject being used as a justification of a policing model that further traumatizes people when they are most vulnerable. It is clear to me and to the people of Seattle and to my colleagues that it is time for change. First, we as a council have committed to listening to, not dictating to, community. This is in direct response to the calls of communities most impacted by police violence, the people who should be central to any and all changes brought forward in the coming days and weeks is the black community. These changes build off some of the mayor's own proposed cuts, but we hear our constituents calling for something meaningful, something more than just a few transfers for the rest of the year. We are putting money back into community where it belongs. We are starting with an investment of $3 million to connect with community where they are and relying on their expertise in order to facilitate the process of scaling up and building true models of community safety. The council also proposes to invest $14 million in the scaling up of community-based violence prevention models and the expansion of direct service interventions like housing, diversion programs, sex worker mutual aid programming, and the such to ensure they are prepared for the journey ahead. We have seen these programs work when we give them the resources they need in order to work. And in fact, the city has a long history of investing in those programs, but unfortunately, that history is one of minimal checkmark investment. Instead of buying bullets, violence, and intimidation, we are choosing, the city council is choosing, to invest in peace and restoration of communities that have been ravaged by generations of racism. We are going to see a reduction in gun and badge positions at the Seattle Police Department. 
It's no secret that 82% of the Seattle Police Department's budget is personnel. And there is no way to meet the demand of communities to, de to, to reduce funding in the Seattle Police Department without taking the step at looking at whether or not the police department is the right size. And that inherently means making policy decisions over the next several weeks about what and what kind of work the police department should be doing and how many officers should be doing that work. We, in this effort to look at where potential layoffs may occur, want to center our strategies on making sure that the chief and the executive are empowered to look at layoffs of officers with histories of misconduct and the elimination of specialty units that have outlived their usefulness. Instead, the mayor paints a picture that the council is interested in eliminating diverse recruits and that those would be the first to go. But the mayor's assertion that there is no way to avoid laying off diverse recruits is simply untrue. Her position is disappointing and I hope that her and the chief will work hard together with us to ensure that that is not the outcome based on the tools available to them. It will be harder and it will mean taking on the Seattle Police Officers Guild at the bargaining table, but it will not be impossible to consider out of order layoffs. And again, just because the process may be cumbersome, just because it may be difficult, doesn't mean that we should not pursue out of order layoffs to avoid the detrimental effect of laying off diverse officers first. The majority of people in Seattle believe we can and must do better. Before becoming a city council member, I spent years, well over a decade, working on and believing in police reform. I fundamentally believe that reform of a police department was something that was possible. But what we saw earlier this summer in response to the George Floyd demonstrations and what we're seeing across the country has reframed my perspective on that point. I have said before, and I'll say it again, that you cannot reform something that is fundamentally broken. Despite what appears to be some differences between the city council and the mayor in both ideologies and values and approaches in addressing this issue, we as a council remain open to working with the executive. And we are standing at the ready to work with the mayor and Chief Best to find a pathway forward that will uproot the harmful systems that have continued to oppress black and indigenous communities and lay the foundation for new systems to be built, that's, to be built that center the humanity, healing, and growth of BIPOC communities. This work will be hard. And today, I hope we can turn a page. The council yesterday took almost, unani took a, almost unanimous votes on almost all the amendments and a unanimous vote on the ultimate package that we are proposing. We as a council are unified in our vision as represented in those proposals. And we now stand at the ready as one unit to come together with the mayor and with the chief to negotiate and talk about our proposals and our vision. And I hope that the invitation that I have sent to the mayor and to the chief in the last 48 hours with a multitude of dates and times to be able to come together and speak and talk about how to chart this path forward are accepted. And I hope that that invitation is accepted with due haste. So I wanna thank you all for uh, being here today and I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over now to my colleague, Councilmember Herbold. Thank you, Council President. So I wanna speak a little bit about how uh, Mayor Durkin keeps saying that we should be realistic and that we've been irresponsible for committing to a goal before we've had the details. I have never in my 22 years in government or eight years prior as an activist inside or outside government, seen a single hard thing, shaking up the status quo 
and responding to a historical moment accomplished by limiting action to what seems realistic. In this instance, reimagining policing means imagining what may not at first seem realistic. By signing on to a stretch goal, the Council began a partnership with community that has brought us to the place where we are today, a unified Council position on the 2020 SPD budget, and a pathway and a plan for how to leverage the decisions that we are making right now to reduce the size of the police department in 2021. We've shared information about the very real barriers to our goals in real time with the community as we were understanding those barriers ourselves. In doing so, I hope we have begun to build trust and made an investment in the leadership infrastructure of the people who are so critical to this important moment, the activists and advocates, the people who have experienced harm at the hands of our criminal injustice system, and the allies who have never had these experiences firsthand, but know that the promise of justice will never ever be delivered if they rem remain complicit and silent to the injustices that they see every day. The executive and the council clearly have a very different approach for meeting the demands of the movement for true community safety. From what they have shared so far, it doesn't seem to involve meaningful structural change or partnering effectively with and empowering community members with these lived experiences. The mayor says that the council and the community have the right ideas, but this is the wrong time. She tells us that she's working with the chief to bring a package that reimagines the police. The problem with this is it ignores exactly what it is that the community has been saying. They're not at the table and they want to be. The community is here now pushing the council and working with us to do what the mayor and the chief say we should do later. The mayor and the chief also seem to be using the structural barriers in our government institutions to say what they can't do. Instead of trying to find a way for us to work together to try and accomplish what we all say we want to accomplish, reduce the footprint of armed police response for each and every social problem, regardless of whether it's the right response. Remember, 56% of 911 calls are non-criminal and only 3% result in arrest. We are asking police officers to do too much, and in doing so, we make our communities less safe. Whether it's in sending a police officer who's armed to a situation that doesn't require an armed response, or in reducing police capacity to address real crime. There's been a lot of interest in the ability of the chief to do out-of-order layoffs. This is one of the institutional structural barriers that I mentioned earlier. The bottom line is that the rule exists and thus it can be used. Our challenge is the executive and council together should figure out how to use it to meet our shared objectives, not start from the supposition that a rule that clearly exists to be used can't be used. On Monday at the press conference that the mayor and chief held, Daniel Beekman of the Seattle Times asked whether or not the chief would submit an out of order layoff request with the Public Safety Civil Service Commission, as she is empowered by the rule to do. The chief instead answered that the decision lies with the Public Safety Civil Service Commission director. But we all understand that. The community understands that. Our request is whether or not she will work with us in developing that request to the PSCSC, a request that has the best chance to preserve the diversity of the police department in a way that is constitutional, legal according to labor law, does not choose layoffs by race, as some have claimed that we are asking, but instead does so in a way that preserves the efficient functioning of the department as the rule itself requires. We're reimagining, and so are local governments all over the country. How are they going to tackle these very same issues? Let's ask these questions and learn, and above all, try. 
And if we're unsuccessful after trying together, then the council, using the proviso instead of making reckless cuts, has voluntarily put ourselves in a position to be accountable and will have to consider lifting the provisos. I hope that doesn't happen. But the real question is, if the executive does not try, then they will be the ones being held accountable. And the question to that branch of government will be, did you really want to reimagine policing in our city? Thank you. And uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague um, on um, the left of the dais, uh, Council Member Tammy Morales. Thank you, Council Member Herbolt. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to begin by saying that as the um, council member representing District 2, uh, the part of the city where black, brown, and indigenous community members, our neighbors, have the last toehold uh, in the city due to gentrification and displacement, also violence, um, you know, this is a community that is over-policed. And I'm here today in this seat because those neighbors elected me to bring their voices to City Hall and to speak for them in this body. I wanna start by honoring the very hard work that my colleagues have been doing. Council members and staff have been diving deep into the police budget, listening to community as we, as we should, and researching other models of community safety from across the country. We've had robust discussions and we've had lots of disagreements, and that's how it should be because we frankly represent different parts of the city who have different perspectives on these issues. But I have the utmost respect for my colleagues and for the work that they do to represent this city. This work is challenging and it's really important work. And the work we've been doing since June by beginning this uh, inquest into the police department reflects our genuine effort to transform what community safety looks like in our city. The mayor and the police chief have sought to undermine our credibility and the hard work of this body. It's disrespectful, it's not collaborative, and when we're talking about the safety of black and brown neighbors, it's downright dangerous. We are duly elected this is a co-equal branch of government, and it is our responsibility to legislate and to determine the priorities for how public dollars are spent. To just hand those duties off to the executive branch and, and uh, for them to decide these matters for us would be irresponsible. I want to be clear. We all know that we are in the midst of a racial reckoning in this country, not just here in Seattle, but across the nation People are rising up to demand that we change our criminal legal system and dismantle it. I don't know why it took the death of George Floyd to shake this country awake and make them pay attention. I don't know why that didn't happen after the murder of Emmett Till or any of the hundreds of thousands of black, brown, and indigenous people who have died in this country who have been killed by state violence or by mob violence. What I do know is that the reckoning is here and we can't let this energy slip away without making dramatic, impactful change, even if it makes us uncomfortable. The demands to demilitarize and divest from the police will not blow over in a matter of months. And if the mayor thinks that a strategy to delegitimize delay and distract from this effort will be successful, she is clearly not paying attention to the movement happening in this country. As we prepare to deliberate on the 2021 budget and what long-term community safety really looks like, it's critical for this body, for this council, to lead with our values of repairing the systemic harm done to our communities by investing in black communities now. For too long, black, brown, and indigenous communities have been told to wait. When prosperity reigns, they are the last to share in it. When austerity hits, they are the first to see cuts. And now when a pandemic strikes, they are most deeply devastated by the health and economic impacts. 
As I've said before, it's time for us to shift power away from systems that have failed to invest in and have regularly exploited the tremendous innovation, brilliance, resistance, and the smart solutions that are happening in black and brown communities. The investments we approved yesterday will support the work that needs to happen now so that when a significant restructure of community safety happens, we have the infrastructure in place to support our neighbors. We're working, this council is working hard to restructure community safety without centering police. We started that work this year. We know that this is work that will continue into next year, starting with the next budget conversation in the fall. The last thing I want to say is that it is clear across the country and here in Seattle, to paraphrase Angela Davis, the people are no longer accepting what they cannot change. They are changing the things they cannot accept. We invite the mayor to walk alongside us or to step out of the way. Thank you. Uh, thank you to my colleagues, Councilmember Herbold, um, Councilmember Morales for um, those words. Um, and I um, also um, deeply respect and appreciate um, all of your collective hard work on behalf of um, your districts and as somebody who represents the entire um, city, obviously um, really respect the district focused voice that you bring to this issue. And I wanna thank you all for um, your tremendous work on this issue and look forward to um, the many hard weeks before us to chart a path forward, to work collaboratively, to engage city stakeholders and to engage continue to engage community stakeholders on delivering on our uh, commitments uh, for 2021. Okay, uh, we are now gonna open it up for questions. I'm gonna hand it over to our communications uh, director, Ms. Dana robinson Sloat. Thank you so much. Uh, we will be taking questions first from the reporters here in council chambers, followed by those reporters who are dialed in on the call. I'll call you in the order of appearance or as you appeared here this morning, and we'll also tee up the person immediately behind you so you can prepare yourselves. So Didi Sun will be the first uh, uh, person asking questions this morning. We've invited Didi and others um, one at a time to come to the public comment mic. And Didi will be followed by Patrick Quinn. Go ahead and speak very close to the microphone. Thank you. This is a question for all three council members. Um, even among protesters, especially in the beginning, there was a lot of division about how money that does end up being divested from SPD should be invested. We talk a lot about investing in black and brown communities, but there's still a big question of where is that money going to go and how it's going to help community. Um, have you given any thought as far as where SPD money is going to go yet as far as specifically for communities? Um, that's an excellent question. We've been working on that very closely. I'm actually going to hand that question over to Councilmember Morales, who's been leading uh, the work on behalf of Council in terms of our proposals related to community investments. Councilmember Morales. Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, we have. Um, yesterday, we're talking specifically about some of the investments. Um, so, as I said, you know, what we're trying to do is dismantle the existing system that doesn't work. We want to spend part of our time doing that. But we also want to spend a significant part of time rebuilding what will take its place. And so we are um, looking to invest in organizations that are doing community safety type programs already, violence prevention, uh, mental health assistance. Um, you know, there are um, uh, folks who teach self-defense, who work on uh, uh, domestic violence intervention, for example. So there are any number of groups that are focused on public safety. Um, and in supporting mental health, um, access to education, um, you know, the kinds of um, uh, uh, investments in our community that really help build healthy communities and help communities thrive. So there is a focus on um, organizations that are doing that kind of public safety uh, focused work already, and that is, that is part of the plan. Thank you. The next question will come from Patrick Quinn, followed by Paul. Thank you. So uh, this question, I guess I'll start with Councilmember Morales, because I think this was a bill that you mainly sponsored, but I know, Councilmember Herbold, you were called on for your input as part of this discussion. 
just due to your experience on the council. It's regarding the navigation team. Um, and just as you just mentioned, council member uh, Morales, you know, a big part of this budget discussion is about dismantling what's not working and then rebuilding it with something that could work instead. Disbanding the navigation team was voted on yesterday in a pretty back and forth controversial mm -hmm. discussion. What will take its place? So we already have uh, what will take its place, right? There is already reach, lead, um, you know, DESC. There are services available already who are working, doing um, street outreach, doing case management, doing referrals to shelters. Um, that work exists. Uh, what we need to do is invest in those kinds of organizations that are already doing the good work to help them scale up because they have the trust of the homeless uh, community. They have the connections and relationships with the shelter providers and the other um, you know, mental health services that folks might need. And they really are the ones who understand how that, um, that system and the constellation of services and providers works. So that's the intention here is to, um, is to provide the resources so that we have the outcomes that we want to see. We want to see more people, not just referred to shelter, but accepting shelter, accepting placement into, um, into permanent supportive housing. So, so that's the um, intent is to see the real outcomes that we want invested in rather than a system that is kind of just moving people around the community. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, and if uh, Council Member Herbold wants to add to that, is that what we are not doing is um, uh, shifting funds away from Parks and Rec, who is the um, entity responsible for trash pickup and helping with um, sort of the, the maintenance and sanitation pieces. So, um, and that, that is correct regarding uh, Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec does do um, some garbage cleanup, primarily in parks, um, but also the Seattle Public Utilities um, works, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with outreach workers on something um, that we on the council began called the Purple Bag Pilot. And outreach workers go um, and distribute purple bags at set, uh, particular locations throughout the city. And we've continuously expanded the number of locations so that um, folks who are living unsheltered have the resources and the ability to maintain their public spaces. And the uh, Seattle Public Utilities then picks up the bags on a, on a regular basis that are left on the curbside. And, and that, that is a really successful program to help mitigate the impacts uh, to people who are living outdoors as well as the surrounding community. Um, I think it's also really important to recognize that um, REACH has begun a, uh, um, a geographic-based outreach uh, approach. So um, they're no longer just focused in the areas where there um, are the highest concentrations of encampments. Um, there are REACH out outreach workers that are um, assigned, if you will, to every part of the city. And so that allows us as council members a point of contact when we hear from our constituents about, um, about locations where people need assistance. Uh, it's really important, I think, to recognize that the relationships that outreach workers build with people who are living outside are integral to um, to uh, building the trust necessary for people to uh, conceive of changing their living situation in those instances where there is another option. So often the options either don't meet people's needs or they don't believe that they will meet people's needs or they don't exist. But when they do exist, where there is some place for people to go to, the relationship that people build, build with outreach workers is really important for people to make that move, particularly people who have been outside the longest. Um, people who have been outside the longest are the ones who um, it's really important that we just don't move those people around because when you just move those people around, what that is doing is that is destroying the relationships that outreach workers are building because then the outreach worker has to figure out where that person has moved to. Um, and these, this is all sort of part of a continuum that, uh, that encourages people, um, again, when, those, when, when there's some, a place available, um, 
and that is really key as well, um, to come inside and, and to believe that either a shelter is going to be low barriers, it's going to allow them to bring their, their belongings, um, bring their pets, be with their, cat, their partner. Um, and so, you know, again, for people who have been outside a lot, that really, uh, for, for a long period of time, um, that takes some time to develop that. So I just want to um, summarize here real quickly. Um, yes, yesterday the city council took steps to, um, to um, shift funding from the navigation team uh, away to other services. And the reality is, is that what we have chosen to do is instead of fund in-house those outreach and homeless services, we are choosing to fund community-based organizations that we have existing contracting relationships with who have shown tremendous success in, uh, in achieving um, moving folks who are currently experiencing homelessness from, uh, from that experience to moving them inside. And so what, what we will expect is that there will be an increased investment in programs like REACH, in programs like LEAD, in programs like CoLEAD, all programs whose entire focus is to do community outreach and engagement to people experiencing homelessness. So the decision we made yesterday was, should the city and city workers be in the business of doing these outreach services, or should we contract with third-party providers to do those services of outreach and engagement. And we have seen that the navigation team in prior evaluations by our independent city auditor and others has a dismal performance rate. Less than 6% of the people that they have come into contact with were actually placed in housing or shelter. In comparison to our third party providers, our nonprofit organizations, whose percentage rate of success is vastly better. Um, and, and I don't want to cite to you what that percentage is, because I don't remember it off the top of my head, but, but perhaps Councilmember Herbold or Morales Unfortunately, do. Unfortunately, I don't. Um, so so uh, next question. I just want to do a quick point of clarification. Sure. So I know um, that trash pickup and litter will still continue through the Parks Department, um, but that actual encampment removals will be discontinued. Um, what happens for encampments that are hazardous or pose a public safety risk, who at this point would come in and remove those? Do you want to take it? You want to be sure. Um, you know, HSD uh, had a, a proposed policy that they were looking at for the NAV team. Um, it was reported on in the CS for Crank. Um, and that proposed policy was to have the navigation team, instead of just um, evicting people from the locations where they are when they, in the instances, that um, those locations um, provide um, a true hazard or uh, a true obstruction. And that, uh, that policy was for the navigation team to work with people to get them to voluntarily move to another outdoor location in those instances when indoor locations were not available. So another safer, um, less hazardous outdoor location. That was something that the director of the Human Service Department was proposing for the navigation team. That policy was not approved. And that's exactly the sort of thing that we've been asking that HSD consider doing, um, is working to, in, in those instances where people are in dangerous locations, help them find other places that are less dangerous, um, like pointing them to a parking lot that's not being used. Um, and that the, the that that uh, that proposal was was not approved. They did not move to that to that approach. Um, but that is something that outreach workers can do. Um, outreach workers can um, take a harm reduction approach, um, whether or not in you know that's exactly the the concept of the purple bag program is by um, outreach workers working with people who are living outdoors to help minimize the impact of their outdoor living um, as it relates to, to their own um, health and safety, but also the impacts to the broader community, whether or not that's picking up garbage in the area that they, that they live themselves. Um, because again, Parks is not going to be picking up garbage in the locations where people live. They'll, they'll do garbage pickup 
around the the um, the encampments and only when it's in parks. But programs like the Purple Bag Program create self-sufficiency uh, with the city working in partnership with the folks who are living outside by providing the bags and providing the pickup. Outreach workers like REACH, like Chief Self uh, Club, like... Um, uh, like the other the other entities that are doing this work that Council President uh, uh, Gonzalez just mentioned, can also work with folks to minimize the harm using harm reduction approaches to the locations where people are at, and they do that. Yeah, um, I think we're ready for the next question, but I would just sort of um, say on that particular point that again, if we invest at the right levels in harm reduction based outreach and engagement to our unsheltered neighbors, we will actually be more effective in minimizing the number of unsanctioned encampments because we will be effectively moving our unhoused neighbors from those encampments to shelter, permanent supportive housing, or another type of housing that meets their needs. That's the bottom line. So we're making a choice here to invest in those outreach services that have shown greater degree of success in eliminating unsanctioned encampments, period. And that's the direction we're moving in. And that's the direction I think we need to keep moving in. Next question. The next question uh, comes from Paul, writing for the C is for Crank, followed by Natalie Swaby. Hi, Paul. First of all, hello everybody, nice to meet you. Hi, nice yeah, to meet right you. Back at you. <laughs> um, so this is actually, this is, I guess, a council member Morales heavy day. Uh, yesterday in the um, budget discussions, you had mentioned deliverables for those contracts for community-based organizations. Could you talk through how, what those deliverables are again, clarify them, and then how they will change over time as we move into the coming year? Sure, so the first uh, sort of bucket of investments that we are talking about is uh, the $3 million in a participatory budget process. Um, and so what the outcomes and deliverables for that would be are, um, you know, creating a work plan. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is, participatory budgeting is, um, is a tool that is uh, a way to democratize access to power, access to resources, and really engage community. And so some of the deliverables for that would be to um, create a work plan, do some language assessment needs because uh, language needs assessment so that we can make sure that everybody in the community can participate. Um, it would also include the actual budget process itself and the training for um, staff. Uh, part of the goal here in particular is to employ young people in our neighborhoods to give them a uh, little income and, and uh, job training opportunities. So, um, so the participatory budget process itself and then the data collection and analysis and reporting back on what that looks like. This particular process is intended to be specifically about um, the public safety elements of the city budget. So that's the first contract that we are looking at um, trying to implement and the kind of work that we're looking to have completed. The other buckets um, are for, as I was saying earlier, um, organizations like uh, Community Passageways, Choose 180, um, you know, the, uh, maybe the Corner Greeter Program at Rainier, Be Action, Rainier Beach Action Coalition, um, Creative Justice, organizations that work with young people, that work with communities most impacted by police violence, who are looking for restorative justice um, uh, tools and practices and really engaging people in that way. So what we are trying to do is scale up those kinds of organizations so that when we start to restructure the police department, um, rather than calling 911 on a young person who's you know, considered to be loitering or who might be doing something that we don't like, um, that there are, there are organizations ready to embrace that young person, offer access to housing, to school, to job training, to the kinds of things that really make our communities healthy and thriving, rather than just moving them into the juvenile justice system, for example. Um, so those are the kinds of outcomes that we're looking for, and the, the deliverables for them would really be around um, how to build up their capacity and their ability to do that work better. Mm 
Uh, well, that bigger pot of money is for uh, an ongoing period. So um, I, I wouldn't expect that that would be all in 2020 necessarily. You know, the work would, the, the contracting would begin, but the work would continue. And um, that process would then lead into the, tw the, um, the planning and the restructuring. So part of it is to get community engagement as well into that uh, restructuring process for 2021 and really get an understanding of what community safety looks like that isn't centering the police. He's bringing them down now. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Before you start. Nice. Natalie will have the last question in the room. We have a number of callers on the line. A number of the callers on the line are already represented by outlets in the room. So being sensitive to time, after Natalie's call, the next caller on the phone to ask the question will be Kevin of SEC Insight. Natalie, please continue. Good morning. First, uh, Council President, I heard you say that in the last 48 hours, you have reached out to mm -hmm. Chief Best and that you are ready to work. One question I just wanted you to tell me, how many conversations have you had with Chief Best about this budget? And if not, why not? And uh, then a question for all three of you. Just want to know, what do you think about the marches that have happened at council members' homes, mm -hmm. police chiefs' homes, the mayor's home? In some cases, there's been vandalism. What do you have to say about that tactic? So I'll, um, I'll just say that I think that there have been a lot of um, uh, uh, conversations around how the executive and um, the legislative branch have engaged on these proposals over the last several weeks. And um, I, I think that all of us at a varying degree, because we're all independently elected officials, have had um, have had interaction with the chief on our own terms. So I don't want to speak for the entire city council. I will say uh, on that issue, I will say that in my mind, it was important to develop a unified council position, which developed yesterday in our committee before having a conversation about what our council is hoping to do and what our vision is and what the mayor and the chief's vision might be. So I think that that step was really important in my mind in order to have a fruitful and meaningful conversation and negotiation with the mayor and chief about where the council as a whole stands. And we now have that position as a city council. Yesterday was a unanimous vote on the proposals introduced by myself, council member Mosqueda, Councilmember Morales and Councilmember Herbold. We are now ready to turn the page, write the new chapter, and engage in meaningful, productive conversations with the chief and with the mayor based on what I see as our directive for the remainder of 2020 and the positions we've taken on items that we wish to be able to begin conversations about for 2021. Now, there's been a lot of assertions that somehow our failure to engage in sausage making at the early process with the executive is a signal or an indication of our disrespect. That couldn't be further from the truth. I sat on the hiring committee and the search committee that looked for our new chief. That chief is Carmen Best. I have, I have respect for her as an individual and as a woman of color in working in this space. I understand that that is difficult. I have communicated that to her directly in the past. So I wanna, I, I wanna just say really clearly that I think we can do this work without tearing each other down. And in fact, in a previous conversation I had with the chief, I told her that. We are going to have moments where we disagree fundamentally on the direction that we are headed, but I will never tear you down because I understand what it means to be a woman of color in a position like yours, like a position of power. And I believe I have stayed true to that. Now in terms of the, would you, would you all like to address the first question or? Go ahead, yeah. that's more verbal. Um, I just also wanna uh, mention that um, we have had SPD represented at our budget committee table several times. Um, we've had um, the chief policy analyst there, we've had their chief, budget officer there. And um, 
we have been engaging directly with SPD staff through this entire process. And it might seem bureaucratic, but the reality is, is that for every budget process, I actually went back and looked, at least dating back to uh, 2016, um, we have had a protocol. I mean, imagine there's nine council offices. Each council office has between three and four staffers. Imagine if during the budget process, uh, um, a, a, a compressed, intense time where we're analyzing um, over a dozen departments, if we picked up the phone and called the chief or called department staff directly, we have a protocol that we are required to use that um, puts our questions from, from our offices and our staff through to central staff, and then they route it to the executive. Anytime we diverge from it, we get scolded. So this is a process that we use to, to process the huge amount of information and, um, and ensure that our questions are getting asked. We received a memo uh, from the chief a couple weeks ago with 18, uh, 18 uh, questions answered in response to um, what she understood um, our interests were and what she understood the, um, the community's interests were. And if, if you only read the letter, you would think that um, we hadn't asked those questions. But in reality, um, those, each one of those questions um, and their answers was the product of the questions that we were asking through our central staff and we were getting answers to um, from her staff. So, and, and that is what has built this budget discussion, and I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Council President Gonzalez. This is, um, this is not a reflection of not wanting to collaborate with the executive. Um, it is, and I, and I, and I really understand, um, you know, it's not unusual during a budget process for um, a department head to um, defend their department from having any cuts at all. Um, but we are making, I think, a very um, scalpel-based approach to cuts, and we want to talk with them about how to implement them. And as it relates to the second question, um, I think we have all individually, and Council President Gonzalez, uh, representing the council, has repeatedly spoken out against uh, violence, hate speech, property damage, uh, regardless of whether or not that was um, at pro protests at um, the homes of elected officials or other public officials um, or, or in the streets. And we will continue to, to call for peaceful tactics in all instances. So you're condemning that kind of behavior at your homes when it's, when it's crossing the line with vandalism? That's correct. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, just a minute. I think Councilmember Morales. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, but I want to say, with respect to your first question, um, you know, I think we all agree that, uh, especially as women of color, we're in uh, hard positions sometimes, um, you know, when it comes to these kinds of negotiations and the and the disagreements that we have. Um, but But just because we are disagreeing with one another doesn't mean we don't respect the work, we don't respect the, um, the obligation to serve our community well, and that's what we're trying to do here. We, we, very do, we very much disagree with the idea of not reducing the police force. That is our policy statement that we are making. That is the goal and the work that we are gonna be work, uh, striving toward over the next several weeks as we uh, enter the next budget process. Um, uh, regarding the Everyday March and the other uh, protests that are happening, I want to say that there is nothing new about, uh, about what's happening. There is a long history in this country of, um, of marching and protesting in front of the homes of elected officials. There's a long history of holding people accountable in front of their homes. Um, and so, um, you know, while we don't condone misogyny, we certainly don't condone any threats. I will say that um, with this particular series of um, protests that we've been experiencing, and each of us has had um, this group of folks come to our home, um, these are young people exercising their First Amendment rights. This is the new generation of people who are, frankly, angry that previous generations have not solved this problem yet. Uh, and so you can't blame them for coming to their elected officials and asking, you know, what the hell's going on? <laughs> 
Um, so I will say that uh, they have come to my home. There is graffiti in front of my house on the street. Uh, they did not trespass. They did not threaten me. My daughter went outside and said hello and offered her support to the movement. Um, and I just, I just want us to put this in perspective because there is nothing new about protests. That's what this country was founded on, um, for better or worse. Uh, and, and I just want to say that the, um, and a lot of these young people are from my district. Uh, and so I do want to offer them uh, respect as well because they are fighting for their future. And as they've said to all of us who have children who came out to the street to greet them with our children, they're fighting for our children's future too. Yeah. And just, and just again, really to be clear, I have spoken very clearly about this. I do not condone, uh, I do not support the use of um, misogynistic language, the use of homophobic language, or um, any of those kinds of tactics in um, in these actions. Um, now, we have been asked in some instances to just categorically say that folks do not have the right to protest, period. And I am not in a position to say that these folks should categorically not be allowed to exercise their First Amendment simply because some of the folks who are there protesting disagree with their position and their tactics. That would be inappropriate and I believe a violation of the oath I've taken to uphold the US Constitution and the Constitution of the state of Washington. Next question. Can I just add one more thing on that? I'm sorry, because I haven't had the opportunity uh, to say um, what I have said to the everyday marchers um, when they came and visited me on, uh, I believe it was Sunday after, or I think it was probably Monday after their Saturday uh, uh, attempt to visit the chief in Snohomish. Um, I haven't had a chance to say this publicly, but I'm incredibly saddened by the fact that they were met um, by um, individuals in that neighborhood um, with guns. Um, in at least one instance, um, a gun was, was brandished. Report, and I, I saw that in the video. Uh, I don't know for a fact that it was pointed at anybody, but that's what the marchers reported. Um, I'm saddened that uh, the people who lived in that neighborhood blocked the street, uh, the public street, um, with a vehicle. I'm saddened um, that they um, uh, were accused of trespassing um, or trying to break the law when they were um, walking on a public street and um, just really, really concerned um, about some of the things that we have been seeing since, um, since June, particularly in Snohomish and in other rural areas when peaceful protesters um, go out and are assumed to be, um, to be intending to engage in unlawful action. Um, and and th these rumors are started by, by people who live in the area and sometimes also by law enforcement. Um, that there are intents to do riots or call them Antifa. Um, and I'm just, I'm really sorry that these, these young people who are, who are fighting for their lives, they're fighting for um, uh, the futures of, of, um, of their families, our families, uh, were met with that kind of a reception. Thanks. Thank you. Then uh, thank you to Kevin of SEC Insight. He has agreed to cede his time. The next question will come from Daniel Beekman, Seattle Times. Thanks a lot. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, so I have a, a question for myself and for my colleague, Sydney Brownstone. Um, uh, you know, her question was basically, the intent seems to be from the discussion yesterday with regard to the amendment defunding the navigation team and taking the police officers, uh, eliminating those positions, the intent seemed to be to uh, stop uh, encampment removals. Um, do you believe that, that these steps will, will, will stop encampment removals? Or even with these steps, could the executive and SPD continue to remove encampments uh, independent of any outreach. And then the second question is just sort of more of a 
a big picture one rather than a deep, you know, the, the nitty gritty details. And it's just that this discussion obviously has been going on about um, encampment removals for a long time. What was it about this moment to take this policy step right now? Uh, did it have to do with the momentum from the defunding and the Black Lives Matter movement? Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dan. Appreciate the, those two questions. The first question related to the navigation team and um, encampment removals and intent is going to be taken by Councilmember Herbold. Your second question related to why now is going to be taken by Councilmember Morales. Thank you. Um, so I think it's important to remember, and thank you for the question, that only a portion of navigation team, uh, only a portion of encampment removals are actually being done by the navigation team. There's a whole other subset of encampment removals in areas that are true obstructions um, that are done by police officers. And I think um, as long as um, the executive continues to see um, this as a policing issue, um, we can expect whether or not there's a navigation team or not for, um, for police officers to um, be uh, continuing what they already are doing, which is uh, removing encampments uh, in areas that have been deemed to be obstructions. Um, and, but, but hopefully um, it will um, not um, uh, morph into sort of um, a rebranded, reimagined navigation team um, to replace the functions that the council is saying um, we, we no longer support. Councilmember Morales. Sure. Um, so, Dan, thanks for the question. Uh, my, my immediate reaction is um, it's, we've been, there's a picture on Twitter right now from Sketch from 2007. People, that's how long we've been trying to end this practice. So, um, so, uh, you know, removing people from the streets has been a problem for a long time. And what we're really trying to do is make sure that we have the outcomes that we're looking for. You know, we've been talking about this in my office since, since day one of this term. And as you recall, um, you know, did have a very long conversation uh, in the Homeless Committee uh, trying to achieve the same goal. So um, what we're trying to do here is uh, eliminate the gatekeeping that's been happening. Uh, we did hear extended conversation from some of the outreach workers during these homelessness uh, committee meetings about their, you know, the, the Byzantine uh, efforts that they had to go through once they would speak to a client, trying to connect to the navigation team, trying to connect to a shelter. Um, trying to support their their clients and just being kind of stonewalled at every effort because there is so much gatekeeping that has been happening that prevents them from really achieving the outcomes that they're intending. So this is really uh, an attempt to shift the, as Councilmember Gonzalez was saying, um, shift our resources into contracting with those organizations that are already doing the work that are doing it well and that have the trust of the homeless community to, uh, to work with them until they are able to find the right place and to move into more stable situations. Next question or a follow-up? Hearing no follow-up. Oh, well, if, if I can, I guess I just, you know, Councilmember Morales, I know this has been a priority for you since day one. And I guess my question wasn't as much you know, directed at why you voted for this now and more about why you think, um, you know, obviously uh, it hasn't happened until now. So why do you think that this moment was the one in which it has happened? Well, I, you know, um, I will say that it was a narrow margin, uh, one that I hope will grow by Monday. Um, but there really is so much, um, you know, we are in a, we are in a global pandemic there is a huge uh, public health crisis right now, and I think there is a realization that we have to get people off the street. We have to make sure that they are getting into non-congregate shelter, and that's what so much of the energy of this council has been about in the last few months, is not just moving people um, or, you know, or getting rid of the NAV team, but making sure that in, in its place, we are creating opportunity for more non-congregate shelter. That's why we've been talking so much about more tiny house villages. It's why we, um, we're really pushing the executive to invest in hotel rooms so that as we're moving people 
um, into, you know, trying to help people get off the street, there is actually a safe place for them to go. And what we were seeing was that um, there was not that final step coming from the navigation team about actually moving them into non-congregate shelter. There's, there seems to be a real unwillingness to make that investment, even though the council has been really clear that that is how we need to do it during COVID, because otherwise we are increasing people's risk for exposure and we're putting people's um, public health in danger. And I'll just um, punctuate that by saying also, Dan, that um, you know really this racial reckoning um, has um, taken um, the, the growth trajectory it has taken because of police violence. But the reality is, is that communities of color, and in particular black communities, are disproportionately impacted by every single system that exists in our society. And homelessness is no exception to that. And injecting policing models to address an issue related to homelessness and encampments is, is just a, another example of how we have allowed law enforcement to creep into issues that law enforcement shouldn't be dealing with in the first place. And we all know that in the recent point in time count that just came out in July of 2020, we hear once again that there is a continuing disproportionality of homelessness among communities of color those individuals are living in these unsanctioned encampments. We see that in the black African-American community who are only 7% of the Seattle King County population, 25% of those individuals uh, surveyed in the point in time count are black and African-American. It's 15% for Latinx persons and 15% for Native American Alaska Natives. So this is an issue that has been coming to the forefront because of those disproportionality um, realities. And again, because we have allowed policing to seep into our homelessness response. And, and I think yesterday we saw the council take a position, um, albeit by a thin margin, on, on choosing a different direction that we have seen has had greater success in terms of moving people from unsanctioned encampments into something safer. Next question. Thank you. Being sensitive to time, I recognize that at least two of our three council members have additional commitments this hour. The next question comes from Tracy Record of the West Seattle blog. Council member Herbold has agreed to take that question. And the final question uh, will go to Hannah Scott of Cairo Radio. Tracy, the floor is yours. Hi, um, that's who the question is for anyway. Um, for those who, who still don't quite understand what's going on, if Council Member Herbal would briefly summarize the uh, precinct disaggregation amendment and how she believes that would uh, keep the chief from uh, going out with her suggestion that the Southwest Precinct would have to be closed if there were dramatic cuts. Uh, great question, thank you. So um, currently, the uh, all of the money for patrol is link, uh, dumped into a patrol, what's called a budget control level. And um, be previously, it used to be aggregated out among the five different precincts. So each precinct had dedicated funding for the functions of, the, the, um, of, of that particular precinct, including the, the um, staffing of, of patrol officers. Um, that was the, the budgeting approach up until just last year. Um, and I just simply want to shift it back to the way it used to be um, so that there is a dedicated source of funds for each precinct and um, that can't be reduced or moved uh, by the executive that is a function of the council. Um, and it makes sure that the council is in control of whether or not the city charter requirement that there be adequate police services in every district is, is complied with by the, by the executive. Any follow-ups? Hearing none. No, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Hearing none, the final question goes to Hannah Scott, Cairo Radio. Hannah. I think you're on mute. Oh. Hannah, you there? All right. 
Going once, going twice. No buyer. Should you let folks know about people downstairs? Are they downstairs? Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we are um, have concluded the period of questions. Um, folks, for those members of the media who are physically present. Sorry, can you hear me? Oh. <laughs> yeah. I closed the auction, Hannah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> One I couldn't question. find the button on this yep. one. Right. Okay, last question. question. Hurry up because I got a hungry baby. Uh, this is specifically for Council President uh, Gonzalez, but anyone else on the panel, too, if they want to weigh in. I'm hearing from people who are concerned. They're not part of the entire effort to mm -hmm. reshape policing, but who live in Seattle and are concerned about the implications about cuts for their own public safety mm -hmm. and wondering what the council would be prepared to to deal with if there was some sort of negative result from cuts to SPD, whether it's too many cuts or too abrupt of cuts, mm -hmm. of a, or too much of a shift, you know, would it, would it be a murder or, or some kind of home invasion that could go wrong because of a lack of police ability? Can you speak to that? Uh, and if that's even a cons something that could happen where there'd be that kind of a reduction in the public safety element in the city? Well, I mean, first of all, Hannah, I, um, I, I reject the premise of, of the question in large part because, um, you know, I think, I think the reality is, is that there's this, um, you know, f false assumption that somehow the mere existence of police prevents um, violent crimes from occurring. Um, we know that's not the case because violent crimes are currently occurring with a fully staffed um, and robustly staffed police department here and across the country. So uh, that being said, we as a council appreciate that we still need to deliver on the charter requirements around public safety as a service to people in the city. So that is exactly why our proposal takes this um, scalpel approach and uh, restricts the executive from spending dollars on a certain number of, um, of sworn officer positions um, and, and, and I think that that is a careful approach, recognizing that we have labor uh, obligations that we have to fulfill. And in the coming weeks, we are prepared to continue our community engagement around how and what the Seattle Police Department should be doing. It is important for us to recognize that there needs to be a narrowing of the scope that inherently impacts the size of the police department. So again, this is this is uh, this is going to be steady work. It's going to be a long-term work plan, uh, and I'm not saying that to negate the sense of urgency that we all feel around this, but we are we recognize that we need to take a careful approach, and that we need to scale up other public safety programs before we can begin the process of drastically um, reducing the size of the police department. So doing it in that fashion, if you can imagine a scale here, if we do it in that fashion, then we should not see any drastic impact to the police department's ability to respond to 911 calls that are of most significant concern. And as just as a reminder, Currently, 56% 50 of 911 calls that the Seattle Police Department responds to are non-criminal activity. Things like parking violations, suspicious activity, welfare checks, property damage. Only 3% of 911 calls received by the Seattle Police Department actually result in an arrest for a crime. So, so clearly we have an opportunity to just narrow in on those things that actually merit a quick and fast 911 response because of the severity of the of the incident, as opposed to just assuming that every incident deserves and needs an armed law enforcement response. That's just simply not the case. And we've also heard from the chief, and we've also heard from um, other police officers here in Seattle and across the country that they have long been saddled with issues that they just don't want to deal with. Things that other systems should be addressing. And I just want to point to a quote that Chief Best gave herself in March of 2019 in an article in Crosscut that said, quote, the fact of the matter is I feel like we're working with a lot of systems that really haven't reached their full potential. 
so that officers end up on the front lines of all of this stuff that we don't need to be at the front lines of. A lot of times we have to be mental health providers or work on drug addiction issues. She continued on to acknowledge that more affordable housing, adequately funded mental health and substance use treatment programs are, it is what is needed in order to address the issues that, that we as a society currently expect the police to respond to. And I think that's the ultimate goal is to, uh, to accomplish that, that balance. And we're gonna um, take, take uh, the next few weeks and the next several months in order to do that engagement. Councilmember Herbal, do you want to add something? Just really, really small. I just want to um, respond to the suggestion that um, the actions that the council is taking is going to result um, in abrupt um, layoffs. There's there's nothing abrupt about giving notice of layoffs that aren't actually expected um, to take effect for months. And um, I believe the department has um, consequently uh, months to plan and and make adjustments. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, all the time that we have. Hearing nothing further. This meeting is adjourned. Oh. Just really, just really quickly, I'm sorry. Um, for folks of the media who are present um, physically, I understand that there are participants from the Everyday March who are downstairs. Adam, are they outside? Yes, they were not outside. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, Adam. I don't need the editorializing. Okay, yeah. great. And, and I just let folks know that we were going to invite the uh, reporters and uh, to. If, if you want to go down and so so um, for those of you who may be interested in speaking to those young I'm folks uh, who yeah. are organizing and participating in the everyday march they are available to the press uh, downstairs it sounds like from Adam's description on the corner of uh, fifth and cherry <laughs> whatever whatever that street is it's been a while since I've been down here yeah thanks, thanks Adam. everybody all right thank you everybody